Greetings everyone and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If this is your first time here or you've been sitting in the back row, please consider hitting that subscribe button and make sure you have your notifications set to all. That way you don't miss any more uploads from me. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crime Cases. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right before I read the first case, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Caution, some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Heavy listener discretion is strongly advised. Today's video will also swap between serial killers and murderers. Just a heads up. Justice for baby Angel Hope, mother guilty of homicide decades later. Baby Angel Hope. After a week-long trial concluded on August 11, 2023 in York County, South Carolina, jurors found 50-year-old Stacy Michelle Rabin guilty of homicide by child abuse and the death of her baby daughter on August 12, 1992. She had also been charged with murder, although the jury was hung on that charge. Rabin was arrested for the baby's death in 2021. The facts of the case presented were heartbreaking. Rabin gave birth to a baby girl she didn't want. Instead of exploring options like adoption, she stabbed and suffocated the child wrapped her in a bed sheet, put her body in a Sears shopping bag, and threw the bag in the Catawba River. Although the baby had stab wounds, the coroner determined that her death was the result of suffocation. It was confirmed that the baby was only hours old when the bag was found by John Pierce, who was swimming in the river at the time. The community rallied and named the child baby Angel Hope so that she wouldn't be referred to as a baby Jane Doe. They also paid to have her buried at the Forest Hill Cemetery in Rock Hill, South Carolina. The case remained unsolved for almost three decades, but as time passed, as in so many other cases, DNA came to the forefront of the investigation and eventually revealed Raven's connection to the child and the crime. Tonight, hours away from what would have been her 31st birthday, that baby finally got justice when a York County jury found her mother guilty of homicide by child abuse, credited to the news release from the York County Solicitor's Office. Rabin identified in 2020. In October 2020, detectives submitted DNA from the 1992 bed sheet to the York County Forensic Biology Lab for testing. The results identified Rabin as a suspect. Prosecutors said her DNA was in a national criminal database due to a previous conviction for drugs. Deputies obtained a warrant for Rabin's arrest for homicide by child abuse and murder. Rabin admitted to authorities that she had given birth to a baby girl inside a van on August 12, 1992, but told deputies she was not financially stable in 1992, already had another child, and didn't think she could take care of the baby. Instead, she claimed she gave the newborn to a couple for adoption and never saw the infant again. The jury, however, did not believe her, finding her guilty of homicide by child abuse, although the jury was hung on the charge of murder. Sentencing for Rabin's sole conviction will be August 21st when she could be sentenced to life in prison. Although she could appeal the conviction, for now, she remains in New York County Jail. I am very thankful for the hard work of our detectives and DNA analysts. Their dedication and ability to work cooperatively has led to the closure of a case that has haunted our community for years. While nothing can right this terrible wrong, there is some comfort in knowing that justice will be served thanks to the men and women who worked on this case. Quoted by Kevin Tolson, York County Sheriff. Arrest Warrant for Rabin. 
The arrest warrant for homicide by child abuse against Rabin stated that around August 12, 1992, she caused the death of her newborn infant daughter through abandonment and the death occurred under circumstances manifesting an extreme indifference to human life. The warrant also stated that deputies based probable cause to arrest Rabin on investigation, recovery of the baby, and other physical evidence, forensic testing, and statements of the defendant. David Parker Ray, the toy box killer, and his accomplices. The Toy Box Killer Like any state, New Mexico experiences its share of violence and murder every year. Each incident a tragedy in its own right. However, the state's history is darkened by one particularly horrifying chapter. David Parker Ray, also known as the Toy Box Killer. His nickname derived from the large toy box, a trailer outfitted with various implements designed for sexual torture, in which he abducted women and held them as sex slaves. While typical murder cases involve shocking acts of violence, Ray's crimes extended well beyond that into the realm of the unimaginably macabre. For years, he engaged in disturbing acts of sexual torture and suspected murder. The abductions extreme, cruelly, and murders committed by Ray and his accomplices, Cynthia Cindy Hendy and Ray's daughter, Glenda Jesse Ray, during the 1990s shocked the state and the nation, exposing a level of brutal inhumanity rarely encountered even in the grim world of violent crime. Ray claimed to have abducted about 40 victims from several states though authorities believe that number is likely higher. David Parker Ray, Childhood Born in New Mexico in 1939, Ray lived in poverty with his younger sister, Peggy Pearl Ray, under the stern and watchful eyes of their maternal grandparents, Russell and Dolly Parker. They lived on a quaint ranch, seemingly lost in the vastness of the high desert where discipline was abundant. Their father, a violent alcoholic, would sporadically breeze into his son's life, bearing not gifts of affection but rather sinister offerings, magazines emblazoned with the haunting images of sadomasochistic pornography. Ray's mother, Nettie Opal Jensen, was supposedly part of his life, but Specific details about her circumstances during Ray's childhood are somewhat vague in available documents. What is known, however, is that David's formative years were turbulent. He was an introvert in high school, so like vultures circling their prey, his peers swooped down upon his shyness with taunts and jeers. He sought refuge in alcohol and narcotics. This crucible molded the early chapters of Ray's life, chapters that would later unfold into a tale of unimaginable darkness. David Parker Ray's Victims As an adult, Ray lived in Elephant Butte, New Mexico, a small town in the central part of the state, about 150 miles south of Albuquerque and just north of Truth or Consequences. The area is mainly rural and is named after an island in Elephant Butte Reservoir, a larger body of water created by a dam on the Rio Grande. Ray's infamous toy box was located in a trailer near his residence in Elephant Butte. Ray was believed to have started his criminal activities around the 1950s. It's unknown how many women and girls David Parker Ray abducted and Ray over the decades because many of them were drugged. Quote, One of his specialties, said Frank Fisher of the FBI, was to give these women drugs that would cause amnesia. But the world ultimately got a shocking inside look at Ray's toy box, toy chamber. 
One of the more chilling aspects of Ray's mythology was using a pre-recorded audio tape which he would play for his victims after they woke up from being drugged. The tape, a cold and clinical rundown of what they were about to experience, was designed to instill maximum fear in his victims. Cynthia Vigil, Jalamilo's Daring Escape Ray and Cindy Hendy were eventually arrested when one of their victims, Cynthia Vigil Jadamido, miraculously escaped the toy box after three days of captivity. Jadamido started selling drugs and sex on the streets of Albuquerque at just the age of only 13. As a young woman, she was lured to Ray's toy box trailer and held captive. She later recounted her terrifying ordeal. Recalling how Ray and Hendy handcuffed her and then electrocuted her with a cattle prod. As the couple drove the trailer out to a remote area, Hadamido unscrewed the cabinet to which she was handcuffed and waited for the RV to slow down. But just when she was about to make a run for it, Ray hit the brakes and she tumbled to the floor. Hendy shocked her with the cattle prod again, rendering her unconscious. When Hadamido woke up, she heard Ray's voice on the tape telling her in graphic detail what would happen to her as his sex slave. For the next few days, Hadamido was tortured and raped. The more pain that I showed, the more I hurt, the more he got off, Hadamido said. The Escape But as Ray and Hindi took her from room to room, she studied her surroundings. After three days of torture, she finally got her chance to escape. Hendy left her alone and left the keys to the padlock on the coffee table. As Hadamilo tried to unlock herself, Hendy returned and began beating her. But Hadamilo picked up two crucial objects, a phone and an ice pick. With one, she called 911. With the other, she stabbed her captor. Then she bolted naked and covered in blood down the road. The first car that drove by her stopped, but the woman driving wouldn't let her inside. Adamido ran to a nearby trailer and received help from an elderly couple whom she later called her guardian angels. A snippet of Ray's journals. Ray meticulously documented his murderous acts in diaries, noting details like the time and place of the kidnappings. Law enforcement speculated that the actual victim count could be significantly higher. However, Ray's journals offered no insights into the events following his brutal activities, leaving an unfortunate gap in understanding his victim's fate. Investigating the Toy Box Case After police responded to Jadamindo's call, they apprehended Ray and Hendy. The two sadistic Ray desperately tried to paint a picture of innocence, alleging that Hadamido was entangled in the throes of heroin addiction and insisting their actions were merely attempts to wean her off the devastating drug. However, the walls of deception they attempted to construct swiftly crumbled under the scrutiny of law enforcement. As authorities delved deeper into the foreboding trailer, they uncovered a chilling collection of torture paraphernalia that starkly contrasted the couple's assertions. The evidence they gathered corroborated Hadamido's herring account and confirmed the sadistic reality of her ordeal. The haunting audio tape was just the beginning, a brutal testament to Ray's intentions. The investigators unearthed an extensive collection of torture apparatus, which included a gruesome assortment of pulleys, whips, and a host of sexually perverse contraptions, revealing the true extent of the horrors that had taken place within the walls of that trailer. Cindy Hendy, Toy Box Killer's Girlfriend Hendy played a significant role in his horrifying crimes. They met in 1997, and not long after, she became involved in his criminal activities. The extent of her participation varies, according to different sources, but it's clear she was deeply complicit 
in the sexual torture and potential murders committed by Ray. During the trial, she testified against Ray, revealing the harrowing details of their crimes. Hendy was convicted of numerous charges, including kidnapping and criminal sexual penetration. She was sentenced to 36 years in prison. As part of her plea bargain, she agreed to testify against Ray. In 2019, after serving approximately two-thirds of her sentence, Hendy was granted parole and released from prison, which caused controversy considering the severity of her crimes. In March of 2022, she was living in Hamilton, Montana. Interestingly enough, Cynthia Vigil Jadamido later claimed to have forgiven Cindy Hendy. I think there was a part of her that was David Parker Ray's victim too. Glenda Jean Jesse Ray, Ray's daughter. Ray's daughter, Glenda Jean Jesse Ray, was also implicated in her father's horrific crimes, accused of actively participating in the abductions and tortures that took place in Ray's toy box. She was arrested by the FBI and initially charged with 12 criminal counts, including kidnapping and criminal sexual penetration. David Parker Ray ultimately pled guilty to the myriad of charges against him to spare his daughter a lengthy sentence. As a result of his deal with prosecutors, his daughter, Glenda Ray, was given a two-and-a-half-year sentence with five years probation for her role in abducting Garrett. Her whereabouts today are unknown. Street Safe, New Mexico Cynthia Vigil Jadamido went on to become a founding member of the nonprofit Street Safe, New Mexico. Through her work with co-founder Christine Barber, Adamido helps give protection and assistance to women living on the street, especially those who are sex workers and vulnerable to violent predators. Adamido and Barbara testify in court when a woman gets raped, ensuring the victim gets the last word. Street Safe assisted the Albuquerque Police Department with investigating the West Mesa serial killer, the Bone Collector who also preyed on sex workers, as many serial killers often do. As far as her role in stopping David Parker Ray, Jaramillo remains both modest and strong, saying that she didn't save other women, she saved herself. I'm not his victim, Cynthia said. I was never his victim. I wish he could have known that. Toy Box Killer Documentary in 2008, a British production released The Sex Chamber, a 45-minute documentary piece about the case of the toy box killer, directed by Nick Gudrich. For those that are interested, you can find the video online by typing The Sex Chamber Documentary. Mary Collins, tragic murder of a girl who just wanted friends. In a world where it seems essential to fit in, one must hope teenagers choose the right friends. Adolescence is when teens spread their wings and parents give a certain amount of trust. As parents, we wait up at night when they are even a little bit late and we can never imagine that their friends would hurt them, let alone kill them. Mary disappeared on March 28th of 2020, the day the governor of North Carolina issued the stay-at-home order for COVID-19. Because of the lockdown, this dreadful story went largely unreported. Who was Mary Collins? Mary Santina Collins was born on July 6th, 1981, to her mother, Casey Del Pezzo. At 20 years old, everyone who talked about Mary described her as kind and gracious. Her elementary school principal, Carolyn Horn, described her as innocent and said she always wanted to hug her in the hallway. People also used the words sweet and vulnerable to define her. She had such a light about her, 
Mary's aunt, Kara Williams, told WCNC News she was loving and just very silly. Her grandmother, Mia Alderman, raised Mary like her child, giving her a stable environment to thrive, which her mother could not provide. Mary had a large family of aunts, cousins, siblings, and her mother, who all protected and loved her. She was just the sweetest person that she expected everyone to be like that. And so she was very vulnerable and easily manipulated. Kara told WCNC. At just three years old, Mary was diagnosed with a rare genetic disorder called Bellocardiofacial Syndrome, which posed some difficulty for her. It can cause learning disabilities, developmental delay, skeletal abnormalities, immune deficiency, and neurologic and psychiatric problems. Mary had a severe speech impediment and the mentality of a 15-year-old. Counting change or navigating her neighborhood was difficult for her. She was also born with a severe cleft palate and didn't speak until she was six years old and her speech was difficult to understand. However, by the time she was in her teens, she could talk to anyone but could not make loud noises or scream. Mary loved cooking, listening to music, and doing photo shoots that captured her extraordinary beauty with her dramatic makeup and various hair colors. The Bully. High school was a fairly good experience for Mary. She hung out with a small group of girls and was not overly picked on. She went out with a couple of boys, but they were normal teen relationships of short duration. One boy was Lavi Pham. The two did everyday adolescent things like listening to music, eating sushi, and spending time with family. However, the relationship did not last long, and there were no hard feelings after the breakup. Mary and Lavi continued their friendship, evolving into pleasant acquaintances. After high school, Mary's friend list diminished. As people were going to college, working and writing for adulthood, Mary was still a 15-year-old in mind, and she wasn't ready for life changes. With Mary's entire family so protective of her, it was especially concerning when a young lady named Kelly Lavery put a target on Mary's back and began bullying her on social media. Kelly would pose comments like, Ew, nobody would want you. If I were you, I would want to disappear as soon as possible. Or, you're a dumb bitch. Kelly would verbally abuse Mary, then apologize and pretend to be friends with her. Because Mary was so forgiving, she perceived that Kelly was being sincere. Kelly began living with Mary's former boyfriend, Lavi, and continued manipulating Mary's feelings. Lavi even participated. Mary's family could see all of Mary's social media activity and surmised that Kelly had severe mental health issues. They tried to caution Mary that Kelly was not her friend. Mary was already insecure about her speech disorder and glasses, and the last thing her family wanted was to see her suffer at the hands of Kelly. Who is Kelly Lavery? Kelly Lavery was born to Patrick and Karen Lavery and lived a privileged life. Her father is a chief enterprise architect in a prestigious and lucrative position, and Daddy gave Kelly anything she wanted. Kelly grew up in a million dollar home at 1047 Rolling Park Lane in Fort Mill, South Carolina. She was known to harass other girls and Mary was no exception. According to Annie Elise, host of the YouTube channel Law and Crime Network, Kelly would write to Mary, I am not jealous. You're really effing stupid. I graduated with a 4.0 in honors, so I don't think so. I'm living rent-free, bills-free. My entire life is handed to me on a diamond-encrusted platter. So, I don't think so, sweetie. Mary asked Kelly why she was so mean to her, and Kelly replied, 
See, you want to know why it doesn't matter? My parents are millionaires. I get to have a bad personality. Are your parents private jet rich? Tesla rich? Designer shit rich? Does your daddy make $700,000 annually? I can treat people however I want. Kelly was the epitome of spoiled and would rub it in the faces of others. When Mary Banished Mary left her home at approximately 2.30 p.m. on March 28, 2020, and was last seen walking along Burnley Road in Charlotte, North Carolina. Her so-called friends, Kelly and Lavi, had sent an Uber to pick her up and take her to the couple's upskill Noda, North Davidson apartment. Knowing Mary's problems with Kelly, Mary's grandmother and family were adamant that she stay home that day. However, wanting to encourage her independence, they gave in and Mary went. Mary's grandmother, Mia, didn't hear from Mary after texting her several times and became worried. The following day on March 29th, Mia tracked Mary's phone to Kelly in Lobby's apartment and went there. When she arrived, Mia knocked and knocked and got no answer. Finally, she began yelling, I guess I'll have to call 911. Kelly answered the door and told Mia that Mary had already left. Mia asked to look around the apartment, and Kelly hesitantly agreed but would not let Mia in the master bedroom. She told Mia that friends were in there and accused Mia of alarming them. Mia begged Kelly to tell her where her daughter was, and Kelly responded, I couldn't give a flying rat's ass about Mary. Crying, Mia asked if Lavi was in the master bedroom, and Kelly reluctantly went to get him. Lavi came out, and Mia began asking him where Mary was. Kelly, in complete control of the situation, would not permit Lavi to answer the questions. It was then that Mia saw Kelly holding a hammer in her hand. Mia looked at Kelly and said, You can't hit me hard enough with that hammer to make me forget about Mary. Kelly then began talking kindly about Mary and said she would help her find her. Mia left and searched around the apartment complex and the neighborhood. Mia filed a missing person report with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department at 11 p.m. on March 31st. She told the investigators that Mary had a cognitive disability and she didn't feel the police department took it seriously. Mary's mother made flyers and the family posted them all around town. Initially, the police went to Kelly's apartment. When they got no answer, they left. Mia was not satisfied that the authorities had yet to talk to anyone at the apartment, so she decided to go back. She called the apartment manager, who agreed to look at the surveillance footage later that day. Detective Jonathan Gaskin told her she could not go back to the apartment that day, but recommended that Mia call 911 again to request the department go out if she felt Mary's life was in extreme danger. Gaskin said he could work the case remotely and that going to the apartment was unnecessary. That would be the first of many disappointments for Mia. Mia informed Gaskin that the manager had surveillance footage and he replied, that's good. The detective did not go to view the footage himself. Mia decided she was not getting anywhere with Gaskin, so she called 911 again. Mary's mother, Mia, at the apartment, and they waited for the police to arrive. When the officer arrived, he knocked on the door, and Lavi answered but refused the officer's entry. Instead, Lavi let Casey in. This time, he let Casey into the backmaster bedroom, and she saw someone asleep in the bed. Lavi told her it was Kelly. Casey left without being any closer to finding her daughter. The responding officer called the office manager and told him to stop looking at the surveillance footage. He inaccurately told the manager he needed to obtain a warrant to view the tape, which was not correct and proved to be one of many mistakes the police department made investigating this case. By the time the police wanted to view the footage, 
it had been deleted just one hour before the request. Such an error by the police department left Mary's family feeling alone and frustrated. So they organized search parties, conducted their own social media investigation, and questioned anyone who would speak to them. They even took shifts outside of Kelly's apartment to ensure no one brought anything out. During the family's investigation of social media, they saw a picture posted of Lavi and another unidentified man who had a knife in his hand. They discovered it was James Jimmy Salerno, and he had been at the apartment at the same time as Mary. The family continued to search using bloodhounds and drones for any sign of Mary. Despite their efforts, they felt that Mary had never left the apartment. At one point, Mia obtained permission from the apartment management to bring the bloodhounds into Kelly's apartment to search, but was told they needed a signature of approval from the lead detective, Gaskin, who never responded to their call. They missed the opportunity. Seven days passed before the Mecklenburg Charlotte Police Department would begin seriously looking into the case. A former homicide detective called the department to inquire about Mary's case and was told that they had received an anonymous tip that Mary had gone missing before. This is why they treated the case with such low priority. We can imagine who made the anonymous phone call. A witness comes forward. On April 2, 2020, the police department received a tip from a witness that said James Jimmy Salerno, 20 years old, Lavi Pham, 21, and Kelly Lavery, 24, had a party at their apartment where Lavi and Kelly tied Mary up and beat her up in the bathtub. The witnesses tell police that Jimmy was bragging about hiding her body in a mattress and how they planned to burn it with Mary's body stuffed inside. Missing person detectives visited the apartment of Kelly and Lavi on April 2, 2020, where Mary had gone and said Lavi agreed to let them do a consent search. Because it was a consented search, police were limited in what they could touch and do. However, detectives reportedly looked under the mattress, not realizing Mary's petite body lay inside. Another witness told police that Lavi was trying to pay someone $4,000 to remove something from the apartment. The witness also said another young woman named America Deal was potentially involved. The witness said Jimmy had confided in him that all of them were hanging out at Kelly's apartment when Kelly and Lavi began beating Mary in the head with a bottle while Mary lay in the bathtub bleeding. Police then obtained a search warrant. This time, they found Mary's body in the mattress. No one could have prepared them for what they had just seen. Mary's body was very well concealed, and I think some of that is reflected in the court record. Detective Brian Crum told WCMT News in an interview, When we went in with a search warrant, it wasn't even apparent until we began looking more closely at things. Detectives had to open the mattress to find Mary. Detectives also found a bloody knife in the corner of a room and Mary's identification and debit card lying on a table. In the master bathroom, they found a serrated knife in the sink. Luminol detected blood on the bath mats and the shower curtain. Luminol on the bathtub and sink lit up like fireworks. Arrests. On April 5, 2020, police arrested Kelly and Lavi at the apartment, according to Nightlab.com. Kelly was reported passed out, and police woke her up to arrest her. Jimmy was arrested at his residence in Charlotte's University area. In June, police arrested America Deal, who had fled to Colorado. They extradited her to North Carolina. Each was questioned and tried to blame the other for what had happened. While being questioned, the detective noticed that Lobby had a cut on his arm, covered in saran wrap. Lobby told the investigator that he had cut it while playing with a knife. 
Lobby lawyered up when detectives began asking more pointed questions about what happened to Mary. Kelly was questioned next. She said she hung out with Mary until she left her apartment for a photo shoot. When explicitly asked about what happened, she also requested an attorney. Third was Jimmy. He blamed Kelly, Lobby, and America, who had just begun dating Jimmy and barely knew Kelly and Lobby. When questioned, America explained that she had just met Jimmy on Tinder and hung out with Lobby and Kelly for a week before Mary's death. She said Jimmy called and asked her to come over because a strange girl was at their apartment. She said that when she arrived at the apartment, Kelly, Lobby, and Jimmy were all doing drugs, including Xanax, Molly, or AKA ecstasy, cocaine, meth, and roxicodone, which is a semi-synthetic opioid. She said she did a little bit of cocaine and Molly. She told detectives that Kelly and Lobby proposed a threesome to Mary, but she refused. Then they asked America, and she claimed she refused too and went to bed. America claimed she woke up at approximately 7 a.m. to take her mother to work and return to the apartment. When she returned to Kelly's, Jimmy ushered her into the bedroom and opened the door to the bathroom, which was entirely covered with blood and she was horrified to see Mary in the bathtub. Lobby gave Jimmy and America money and told them to go to the store for cleaning supplies and bleach. When they returned, America said Kelly held a knife up to her neck and forced her to wrap up Mary's body in saran wrap and clean the steam. She noted that Lobby and Jimmy laughed and talked about the terrible things they had done to Mary. After they sexually assaulted Mary, America said they let her bleed out from a cut to the neck and made her watch Lavi and Kelly have sex. The one consistent thing in all of their accounts was that Kelly was the ringleader and had perpetrated the violent stabbing. According to America, Kelly had gone primal and did not stop stabbing. Mary had accidentally cut Levi's arm with a knife. The lingering question is, why? Despite the information obtained in the interviews of the four perpetrators, police were no closer to an answer. Police charged Kelly, Lobby, and Jimmy with kidnapping, murder, and concealing a death. America was charged as an accessory after the fact and concealing a death. The Night of the Murder According to her family, Kelly, 24, and Lobby brought Mary sushi in the hours preceding the murder. They posted a video of the three of them together to make it seem like Mary was okay and just hanging out with her friends. Lobby posted a video of the three of them having fun on his Twitter account. Her family believes he did that to make it seem like Mary was okay and just hanging out with her friends. Police believe that Kelly, Lobby, and Jimmy brutally attacked Mary, stabbing her more than 133 times. Police found text messages between Lobby and Kelly while Mary was there. The text conveyed that Lobby began drugging Mary after they had sushi. He used Xanax and Molly. In one text from Lobby to Kelly, he said, another bar down. During that time, Lavi also sent text messages to Jimmy, relaying information about what he was doing. Mary was the only person who did not know what was happening. She must have been so afraid. Autopsy Report J. Michael Sullivan, M.D., conducted the autopsy, which contains unsettling and graphic details. In the report, it says Mary died of multiple cut wounds and stab wounds of the neck, torso, head, and extremities. She suffered 133 slice wounds and 24 stab wounds, none deep enough to kill Mary, but enough to torture her. There was also blunt trauma injuries along with multiple facial contusions. Mary had also been violently sexually assaulted According to Law and Crime Network, the DNA of two male individuals was found on her body.
due to contamination and degradation. When the killers tried to clean up after the murder, the DNA was inconclusive. It is reported that Kelly, Lavi, and Jimmy committed the murder and left Mary bleeding out in the bathtub. They wrapped Mary's entire body in saran wrap and black garbage bags with silver duct tape covering most of her body in an overlapping, circumferential fashion. Sullivan found a black shirt and socks wrapped around her head and a red shirt around her ankles. It is believed those items were placed on those locations of the body to soak up blood. Mary had a chain collar on her neck attached to a leash when she was found. Her body was identified by dental comparison. Cleanup. Warrants reflected that Mary was saturated in Cascade dish detergent and pumpkin spice shower gel to cover the smell of her body. After wrapping her up, they hid her body inside a mattress. Analysis concluded it was America's fingerprints that matched the inside of the trash bags used to conceal Mary's body. During a bond hearing for America, her attorneys argued that she should be released claiming America was forced to help and Kelly was in charge. According to America, Kelly was the ringleader and gave orders to everyone during the cleanup. Against the family's wishes, the prosecution struck a deal with Kelly. She pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, kidnapping, and concealment of a body and was sentenced to a mere 25 to 30 years in prison. Remembering Mary... Mary's aunt, Kara, had struggled with the death of her precious niece. Kara told Charlotte Michelle Bowden of WCNC, I think that they are evil. I think that they are what evil looks like. They tortured her. They stabbed her over a hundred times, and then they hid her body in a mattress. To know this happened to Mary who I just know was so excited to hang out with some friends, and I can't imagine when they started to turn on her, the fear and confusion she was feeling. And then to think what she went through, it's so horrible, absolutely horrible. Kara says the most challenging thing is having to think about how they tortured Mary and how she can't take the pain away that Mary must have experienced. It's not something you forget, and time will heal, and you will move on from, said Kara. It stays with you, and the mental images stay with you. Kara and Mary's grandmother now have post-traumatic stress disorder, and say it affects everything in their lives. They are unable to even watch the news for fear of seeing reports about other murders triggering their symptoms. Mia found Kelly's plea deal hard to accept. Nobody is going to tell me that Mary's life, the value of her life, is 25 years, said Mia. Mary mattered more than that. The demanding defendants await trial dates, and Jimmy and America are out on bond. Due to a backlog of cases in North Carolina, it could be years before they go to trial. In the meantime, Mary's family has set up a nonprofit organization called Mary's Voice to promote awareness of Mary's case, highlight flaws in the death penalty, and create an additional national alert for missing persons with disabilities and improve police response. The criminal justice system failed Mary and her family from the day she went missing. Now, we can only hope that the jurors see these monsters for who they really are, and that they get life in prison, and nothing less, because Mary never got to negotiate a deal for her own life. Before I begin this next serial killer, I also narrated this over on my horror channel, but I hope the story's a little bit different and gives more information than what I read before. Anyway, this is one of my most shocking serial killers. All right, here we go. 
Herb Baumeister, serial killer linked to dozens of murdered gay men. A typical Midwest family man. Herbert Herb Richard Baumeister, 49, was a businessman, husband, father, and suspected serial killer. During the 1990s, Baumeister was a resident of an Indianapolis suburb of Westfield, Indiana. He is suspected of luring over a dozen gay men to his house before murdering them. Baumeister committed suicide soon after his property was searched and bodies were found in 1996. Recently, the Hamilton County Coroner's Office and authorities have renewed efforts to name those victims who remain unidentified. A Gruesome Discovery On June 24, 1996, Baumeister's youngest teen son, Eric, discovered bones while on the family's 18-acre Fox Hollow Farm estate in a secluded wooded area of Hamilton County. The bones were located approximately 60 yards from the home. Dayton Daily News reported that Eric found a skull and showed it to his mother, Julie Baumeister, who located the rest of the skeleton in the fallen leaves. When she confronted her husband, Baumeister explained it away, telling his family it was a medical skeleton, part of his late father's anesthesiology medical practice. Baumeister said he had buried it in the yard after finding it in the garage while cleaning it out. It seemed to make sense to his wife as Baumeister was a collector and kept everything. At that time, the discovery was only mentioned in the Indianapolis Star. There were no headlines, but the incident started an investigation. The bones were identified as human three days later, along with additional remains found by Hamilton County first responders. Authorities were puzzled, and former Sheriff Joe Cook told the Indianapolis Star, it's an unusual spot to find bodies. Most of the bones were located in two dense locations in the woods, some partially burned. During the search in 1996, authorities discovered over 10,000 bone fragments belonging to several men. The remains are still being analyzed today and compared to missing person files in the Federal Bureau of Investigation, National Crime Investigation Center database. Police estimate there are as many as 25 victims located at Fox Hollow Farm. Baumeister committed suicide by shooting himself in the head less than two weeks after the remains were discovered. Sergeant Kenneth C. Wisman told the New York Times that his suicide note did not mention the murders or the remains found on his sprawling estate. Who was Herbert Baumeister? Herbert Baumeister was born in Indianapolis, Indiana on April 7, 1947 to anesthesiologist Herbert Eugene Baumeister and Elizabeth Baumeister. He was the oldest of four children and he reportedly grew up in a normal suburban childhood until adolescence when he began exhibiting antisocial behavior. His friends reported he displayed traits of urophilia, a condition that caused him to wonder what tasting human urine was like, creating sexual arousal. Baumeister also liked urinating on teachers' desks and played with dead animals. During his teens, his father sent him for psychiatric evaluations, and he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and antisocial personality disorder, but he never received any professional treatment. He attended North Central High School but never fit in and would spend much of his time alone. In 1965, Baumeister attended Indiana University but dropped out after one semester. Later, he attended Butler University for one semester. Baumeister bounced around jobs as an adult. Though he had a strong work ethic, his behavior became progressively bizarre. In 1971, Baumeister married Juliana Julie Sater, and they had three children. 
Julie would later tell others that they only had intimate sexual relations six times over the 25 years of marriage, and she had never seen her husband nude. Six months into the marriage, Julie told Baumeister's father that he had been hurting and needed help. So, Baumeister's father had him involuntarily committed to a mental institution for two months. Later, Baumeister created a Save-A-Lot thrift store chain in Indianapolis, which became quite successful. Baumeister and his wife purchased the Fox Hollow Farm in May of 1988. How did his wife not know? Julie, who was 48 by then, usually left town once a month with her son Eric, 15, and daughters Emily, 12, and Marn, 17, to stay at a lakeside condo about 100 miles north, owned by Baumeister's mother, Elizabeth. To Julie's knowledge, Baumeister stayed home during the week, tending to his own company. Julie would later find out that her husband frequented Indianapolis gay bars at night. Baumeister had other chilling secrets. While Baumeister visited his condo, police found thousands of partially burned bone pieces that belonged to seven people. Initially, four were identified by authorities. Stephen Hell, 26, Roger Allen Goodlett, 33, Richard Hamilton, 20, all from Indianapolis, and Manuel Resendez, 31, of Lafayette, Indiana. All had frequented the same bars as Baumeister and vanished on days Julie had been out of town. The day after authorities began searching the Fox Hollow Farm property, Baumeister disappeared. He remained missing for eight days until campers found his body in Ontario's Pinery Provincial Park, lying beside his car. He had shot himself in the head with a 357 Magnum. Baumeister left behind a three-page suicide note that rambled on about being sorry for the family's financial woes as his company was almost bankrupt. He never once mentioned the horrific crimes he allegedly committed. After the incident, Julie was in shock. She had led a private life with a close-knit family and had very few friends. She recalled that she and her husband doted on their children and Baumeister was involved in every aspect of their upbringing. To those outside the family, they lived an idyllic family life. Julie had no idea Baumeister was a predator and would frequently go to the Metropolitan Restaurant and Nightclub, a popular destination for gay males. The owner of the club, Jim Brown, told People Magazine that Baumeister never seemed comfortable being there. Men disappearing. In 1993, gay men began vanishing from Indianapolis. Ten would disappear over two years. Authorities searched gay bars, questioned patrons, and posted flyers, but leads were few. However, in 1994, a man told the police about an encounter he had with a man named Brian. He said they went to his estate and at Brian's direction, they engaged in autoerotic asphyxia, which involves sex and suffocation. The man had been distressed by the encounter, and in 1995, he saw Brian again. Concerned about the rash of disappearances of gay men, he wrote down Brian's license plate number. That was the critical lead that police needed to identify Brian as Herb Baumeister. Was he operating before 1993? Between June 1980 and October 1991, authorities began finding bodies along Interstate 70. Still unsolved, the serial killer was given the nickname I-70 Strangler. The killer met his victims at popular gay bars within a four-block radius of Indianapolis. Authorities believe Baumeister was also the I-70 Strangler. In total, 12 men were recorded as his victims. According to FBI profilers, the killer was a white man between the ages of 20 and 30 who worked in a low-skilled job with a fan of military paraphernalia and led a healthy lifestyle. During the day, the killer would express homophobic views 
but secretly a latent homosexual who murdered the young men due to self-hatred and shame. After the remains were located at Baumeister's property, he was named the primary suspect in the I-70 cases. Alan Livingston of Indianapolis went missing when he was 27 years old in August of 1993. He is one of the first victims identified when County Coroner Jeff Jellison sent a batch of 44 DNA samples to the state police in late 2022. Authorities have now linked Baumeister to nine victims. Jellison asked family members of missing men during the 1980s and 90s to submit DNA samples to help with identification. Eric Pragner was one of the first family members to answer the call and submit his DNA. It confirmed Alan Livingston was one of Baumeister's victims. Cranger told the Indy Star that he submitted his DNA because he suspected Livingston could have been one of Baumeister's victims. Cranger was only six years old and did not know his cousin that well, but there was a rush because Livingston's mother, Sharon, had terminal cancer and deserved to know what happened to her son. Officials say the investigation is ongoing as they work to identify nearly 10,000 human remains recovered from Baumeister's property. As for Julie and her children, they remain shocked that their husband and father could have committed such gruesome acts. In the scope of things, Julie and her three children are also victims of Baumeister and must try to reconcile their love for him alongside his utter betrayal. Our biggest question now is how he could have loved us and done this Julie told people, happiness as we knew it is never going to return. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these True Crime Cases, Volume 14. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special thank you to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spite, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita B., Doba Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty's Niece, Denise S., Paul Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all so much for your continued support. For without you, there would be no me, and there would be no back to ashes. I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. Until next time, please stay safe out there and take care of yourself. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.